So remember, in our organization, uh, doubt, questioning is encouraged. In our organization, uh, not being holy and not being fully convinced and not really believing is encouraged. And in our organization, I don't want this fold your hands. I believe in everything you say, that you're a God, and there's nothing ever wrong, and I'm not allowed to have doubt in your holiness. I'm not allowed to have doubt or anything is uh, not encouraged. So, have doubts. Have questions. Don't, don't try to be holy. Don't try to be perfect. Don't think that, oh, you know, I, I don't understand everything and I have to pretend that I have all this tremendous faith and understanding and I'm really, really stable. When you're not, just be yourself. So you're not going to believe things, you're, you're going to doubt things, you're going to understand things, it's okay. Actually, what religion can satisfy all your doubts? What religion is well? Can satisfy every single doubt. Then you say, well, exactly, that's why I don't practice religion. But then again, if you don't practice religion, what philosophy or what way of life satisfy all your doubts also? In fact, without religion, you have even more doubts. Without a strong, good religious kind of thinking, religious doesn't mean to pray, I believe, I'm holy, I'm not going to go to hell. That's not what I'm talking about religion. That is what mainstream people indoctrinate people with. And I don't like this kind of indoctrination where, oh, you know, um, um, That if you don't have religion, you'll be all right. Or you do have religion, you don't be all right. What I'm interested in is, is getting knowledge, getting knowledge, and understanding. And uh, R one, the next class is about ten thirty or ten. Ten thirty. Yeah. So I'm interested in more um, having doubts, but having less doubts. There's no way that I'm going to be able to spend the rest of my life with you guys and eliminate all your doubts. There's no way. But it will be enough where we can practice the reason of the level. So if we were to think that, oh, we're not going to have any doubts and everything's going to be perfect, no. It's not going to be like, we have to be very realistic. So if we enter religious practice with realistic thinking, then we'll have realistic results. If we enter religious practice with unrealistic thinking, then we're going to be very disappointed. And that one comes from ourselves. For example, Whether we're religious, or we're not religious, or we're Buddhist, or we're not Buddhist, all of us experience the same problems and difficulties. And whether we believe in a religion, or we don't believe in a religion, or half-hearted about it, we're going to experience the exact same problems. All the problems that we experience will be exactly the same. So, whether you believe in Buddha, or you don't believe in Buddha, we're going to have financial problems. We're going to have relationship problems. We're going to have, you know, anger, and we're going to have a disappointment, and uh, people are going to say no to us, and put us down, and put us up, and, and use us, and not use us, and, and all this is going to happen. So when we practice religion, I notice for many people, because I've heard this on forums, I've heard this on emails, thousands of times, literally thousands, and for the last 15 years that I've been teaching, I've heard it from hundreds and hundreds of people that I'm praying and I'm doing the offerings. And I'm meditating, and, and I'm, I'm doing the mantras, and I'm doing the pujas, but how come things don't change for me? How come I'm still in a difficult rut, or I'm in a difficult situation, and I think I'm going to give up, or I'm going to change my lineage, or I'm going to go to another center, or I'm going to try a new guru, or I'm not going to do this anymore, I'm going to change my religion, or I'm not going to practice anymore, I just give up. Why is it all the time that I do everything, and I even donate to the temples, and, and you know, and, and I'm really good to the monks, and, and I've really been listening to my guru for the last 10 years, and I'm really a good student, and how come I still have all these problems? So, what I want to say is that the whole projection of how religious practice helps us, we have these kind of perceptions about um, religion, and how it's supposed to help us, and what I want to say is I want that to smash. Why do I want to smash? Because it's a projection. When we pray to a god, in monotheism, when we pray to a Buddha, or we don't pray to anything, um, the problems are exactly the same. The difficulties are exactly the same. Religious, not religious, or whatever religion you people experience from. And some people in this religion experience more, some people in this less. It's, it's all the same. It all evens out when you actually do a survey. So the thing is, this is why God is not listening. Buddha is a liar. You know, what is that? 
So for many, many years, I realized that people actually ask these questions because they want to change, they want to give up, they want to go to another guru, they want to go to another religion, they don't want to do religion, they don't want to practice, they give up. And, uh, and they ask these questions and made me think because um, in me, I really don't have that kind of thought. I haven't had that kind of deep thought like, oh, I'm not going to do it anymore for 30, 20, 30 years. I mean, there were small little hitches here and there. But to really ultimately say, I don't want to do it, never really arose. So I examined what's the difference. And I realized one thing is that a lot of people, I would say about 90 to 95 percent, yes, the percentage is that high. How do I say the percentage is that high? Because for the years of being teaching Dhamma and taking interviews and meeting people and privately and in groups and in large masses, the questions are always the same. So the questions being the same, I can gauge pretty much their mind is pretty much coming from the same direction. And, and that is, when we enter religion, we feel that what we chant and what we pray and what we meditate are supposed to solve the problems. And that's why we enter religion. We enter religion to solve our problems. You see, the thing is this, is that I find that that's a wrong view. I find that that's a wrong view is because religion didn't make our problems. We made our problems. We never gave control over to religion. We never gave control over to our gurus. We never gave control over to our teachers or our spiritual friends. We had control. You know, we had control of the relationship. We had control of the food we ate, the clothes we, we, we wear, where we live, and what we learn, and what we do, and what we choose and not choose, and the mistakes we make. We had full control. But because we had full control, but when we lose control, we go to someone to say, hey, you know, give me control back. But when you never gave control in the first place, then when you lose it, why do you blame religion? You know, you can't. So to say that I pray to Lama Tsongkhapa and I pray to Lord Sachan and my problems are not being solved is very unrealistic. And I don't mean to be cruel or I don't mean to be direct or mean in that. I, I mean it as a really, as a kind of a knowledge thing. When we enter religion, then you're thinking to yourself, okay, why do we enter religion? We enter religion is not to eradicate the problems because religion doesn't have the power to eradicate problems. I know that's a little shocking, scary. Um, that's not what you've been taught. That's not how you grew up. That's not, what, that's not what you think. But look, you can be wrong sometimes. I can be wrong sometimes. So in this case, our approach to religion for a lot of people is wrong. If it's not wrong, we wouldn't have any problems in the world. Because most of the planet is praying all the time. There's some people praying five times a day. So why is there so many problems? Why? And we're thinking, well, God is supposed to take care of it. Well, either God is not dead, or He never existed, or it's just a figment of our imagination, or He's given up. I mean, you know, that's the choices, because we don't see the problems in the world getting smaller. We see it getting larger. And then people say, well, He gave you free mind to do what you want. Why did He give you a mind in the first place? If He knows that you're going to do all these nasty things. You know, like global warming and all that stuff, you know, the deforestation and, and rape and all these things. You know, why give you why give a mind to do things to other minds? I don't understand. I mean God is omniscient. I'm not criticizing. I'm not criticizing and I'm not pointing fingers. I'm using this as meditational points to help you think. I don't take the God theory and I don't take the non God theory. I don't deal with it because why it all doesn't make sense to me. And I'm not right, I'm not wrong, but that's how I live. So the thing is this, is that the Buddha, the Buddhism had these incredible fierce star protectors that, you know, you know, they, they arrive in whirlwinds and, 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 and huge winds and black, surrounded by fire and, and lightning and, and, and they're surrounded by extreme smoke and, you know, there are huge mountains and they have three eyes that look in the past, present and future. And when we pray to them and make black tea to them, aren't they supposed to solve our problems? Why are our problems solved? So the thing is this, is that religion doesn't solve our problems. Religion is designed to give us a clear indication of where our mind comes from, how it operates, how it creates projections, and how it reacts from projections, and from that, we can solve or we can, we can create our problems. 
So what religion is supposed to do is to help us change our mind. When we change our mind, when we change our perception, and we change our kind of expectation, expectation and projection, and when problems come, they can be problems, or they cannot be problems. A problem for one person is a challenge that makes them grow. A problem for another person is, a, is something that drags them down. So it cannot be the side of the problem that creates a happiness. It must be from the side of the receiver, of the, the person that's receiving the problems. So therefore, what am I trying to say is, if we always think along the lines that religion can solve our problem, our friend can solve our problem, a husband or a wife or whatever can solve our problem, our parents can solve our problem, if we always live our life that way, what we're innately and subconsciously doing is this, not taking responsibility. And when we don't take responsibility and we throw it out to the deities, we throw it out to the protector, we throw it out to our, our God or whatever, right? And then we say, look, I pray I've done this and this and this and my problem is not solved, then we get this movement. Or we become Sunday pew warmers. Or we just go for puja and just pray and go for puja and go pray and things don't get solved, we don't think about it because, you know, we don't have anything else to do with our life. And we don't have anything else really going on. So we might as well just, you know, join the religious group because we can meet people, hang around, have a good time, paint ourselves green and all kinds of strange things. In any case, my point is, what is, if we go into religion, if we go into religion, knowing how it helps us and why we're going into it, there is no dissolution. There is no anger. None. Why? If you've lived with a person for five years, six years, three years, two years, and you've examined them, and you know their good points and their bad points and their weaknesses and their pluses, and then you say, I'm going to get married, most likely after you get married, it's going to be pretty much the same. It's going to be all right. But if you go into a relationship and you've been, you meet this person once a week, you know, and, and for a few hours, and then everything is hunky dory, and you're ready, and you dress up, and you know, you put on your best face, and then you really don't know each other, and then you get married, a lot of problems arise because why you're getting married not from reality but from projection and expectation. What's the difference? The mind operates the same for everything. It's just like things we buy, clothes we buy, food we buy, houses and cars. Everything we buy, we expect it to make us happy. Because if we get that, we're going to be happy. Because why? Marketing is great for the world. People make billions of dollars over marketing, for marketing, from marketing. So when they look at this, they go, hey, you know, um, if I have that, I'm going to look like that person on the billboard. And I'm really happy because they're smiling. They're perpetually smiling. Every time you walk by, drive by, you know, you, you move by, the person on that billboard is smiling and they don't age either. And you're like, oh, you know, some billboards in KL have been there for five years. They're still smiling at you. <laughs> yes. And, uh, in fact, I would like to get on some of those billboards. Not me, but our, our outlets. I have been plotting. But in any case, um, and that's what we're having an illusion of. It's very strong subliminal messages. So what I want to say is I want to break through that. I want this session and what I'm saying to be spoken out to the world of religious practitioners. Do not be discouraged. You won't be discouraged if you don't have wrong expectation. I didn't say expectation, wrong expectation. You won't be discouraged with your teacher. You won't be discouraged with your faith, with your religion, with your doctrine, or whatever you're in, if you enter it with the right attitude with the right expectation. And that is that religion changes your thought, not brainwash. Brainwashing is you're not allowed to think, just do it. You know, like the Sanyang moons in Korea, you know, just how you get married. You know, they get married. Because I met people from that group, you know, they were told to get married, and I said, who's your wife? And they don't know, they don't even know the name. I'm not kidding. And they just live with this woman, and they just hang out with her, and then, you know, then that's it. And I said, are you happy? They said, yeah, I'm told to be happy. And then, I met this guy from Germany who was part of that group, but he ran away later on. So I met him in Delhi, and, um, well, we had to pack, pack, uh, we, uh, everywhere in Delhi, we had to tell them to eat, get dressed, let's go, because he was so used to being told. Everything he did, you had to tell him. It was unbelievable. And he looked totally normal. Good-looking guy, normal, from Germany, in his mid-30s. I was like, so, okay, I don't, I don't need this, you know. So I, I lost them along the way. Because I got to tell him, you know, what do you want to eat? And then he doesn't know, and then we order something, and then we have to say, eat. Because he actually sits there like this. 
He doesn't look stupid or, or, or spaced out, he just, he's waiting for commands. He's lived like that for years. Like seven or eight years in, in Korea. Amazing. If we take religion for what it really is, we will not have disadvantages. That is not to say the Buddha doesn't have power. That is not to say the Dhamma protectors doesn't have power. But how they're supposed to use their power, or how they're supposed to help you, is the key. Is the key. You see, you can't make a lot of problems and not get control, or not take responsibility and just throw it on them and say, oh, you take care of it. You can't do that. You can't be doing all this and throwing it onto them and say, you take care of it, and then when you do black tea, it doesn't work, and say, see, the Dhamma protector is not strong. Impossible. It's not like that. You have to take responsibility. They say, well, if I take responsibility, why do I need religion? Because you need to have knowledge on how or how to take responsibility. What direction to take responsibility? Where responsibility arises. You need that knowledge. So it's a very beautiful marriage. Logic and not having wrong projections. So what happens is we should enter religion, or in our case, let's just focus on one. In our case, when we enter Buddhism, do not think meditation doesn't have power, it does. Do not think that we just don't have power, it does. I will personally attest to that. After having said all that, I will personally attest to it. Do not think that the Dharma protectors do not have power. Do not think that they're not real. They're just figments of people's imagination through, you know, drawn on compass because they were born into bed, nothing to do. Do not think that Tar cannot help. Do not think things like that. I can personally attest it has a lot of power, and they exist, and it's real. But how they help us and what we need to do to receive their help is the key. So if we don't know that, if we don't know that, we will get hurt this moment. If we don't know that. If we know that, we will just go leaps and bounds. All leaps and bounds. So what happens is we should enter the Dharma knowing that, like a sick person, we need help. And you need a doctor, you need nurses, and you need medication. So a sick person will go to the hospital, and they will seek a good doctor. That's the Buddha. They'll get a great treatment, that's the Dharma, and then they need help to administer the medicine, to tell them their regimen, their diet, what to do and what not to do, and physiotherapy or what not. That's the nurses, and that's the Sangha or the support group. Sangha represents ordained beings, but in our case, it would be cage members or Dharma members to support each other. So when we have that kind of attitude, it's very good. We don't go to hospital talking to the doctor saying, you know, I have financial problems in care of it. You know, well, I, uh, my wife has been uh, looking at other men and uh, and going out with them and take care of it. Um, I have five mistresses and, and should I get rid of them and go back to my family, you know, or how? You know, you don't go to the doctor and tell them all these stuff, right? You don't go to the hospital and say, hey, guess what? You tell them everything but your disease. But that's what we do with religion. We go to our gurus and we tell them everything. Our financial problems, how many millions of dollars we owe, how many people we've hurt, our relationships. We talk about our disasters. We talk about black magic. We talk about, you know, disappointments. We talk about our kids not respecting us. We talk about our parents not understanding us. We're talking about all these things to our gurus. And those are all women. These are not things we go and approach our gurus. Why? A guru teaches you dharma. A guru is not a bank. A guru is not a counselor. A guru is not a bow, but you know, a magician. A guru is not someone that actually does all that for you. And then when you go there, you throw all this on their laps and then you solve my problem and they don't solve it. And they say, well, I'm very disappointed. I'm gonna go find a more powerful guru. Good luck. When you find a more powerful guru, let me know. Because I've got some problems to talk to him about too, for him to solve. If you find a guru that can get your money, take care of your relationship problems, heal all your disease, let me know. Really, let me know. Until today, I haven't found a guru that can do that. If you go to the Dalai Lama, or you go to Lord Buddha, if you go to Tongkapa, it would be the same thing. I mean, look at the case of the lady with the dead, dead uh, child. She went to the Buddha and said, resurrect him. Resurrect them. He can. There were cases where he resurrected the dead because their karma is not finished. But there was a teaching. Lord Buddha did not resurrect or could not resurrect that child. But an incredible teaching arose in the mind from that. You guys should know that story. So what's my point? Is 
Well, why are we going towards the loser saying, resurrect my relationship, resurrect my finances, resurrect me? When Buddha can do that, why, why do you think your Guru's going to do that? If Lord Buddha can do that, trust me, Samaritan is not able to do that. If Lord Buddha is able to do all that, then Samaritan one day might reach the ability to do all that he becomes a Buddha. When he becomes a Buddha, that's the key. But until then, why do we harass our spiritual teachers with all these kind of questions? And they say, well, why do we go to them? Exactly. Exactly. Our whole approach to religious practice and our approaching teachers is actually a wrong projection. We're not wrong or bad, a wrong projection. Because we feel that we don't have to take any responsibility, we don't have to do any work, and we can just, we don't have to give control to anyone. We take control, we decide what we want to do, and when we mess up, we throw the problem to someone else and tell them, look, you solve it for me. But if you had to ask your group, should I marry this person in the first place or not? If it comes out wrong, say what you told me. But if you never consult your guru in the first place, why would you go to him for that? Then business invest investments, business finances, you don't tell them the details, you don't tell them all the nuances of what's going on and everything. But when it goes wrong, solve my problem. That's very wrong. Why is that very wrong? Because the whole approach to religion is wrong. So when we approach with that kind of approach, when we approach with that kind of approach, we will be disappointed. Who disappointed us? Our lack of enough knowledge. Were we bad? Who disappointed us? Our lack of knowledge. Our lack of understanding. And I find that a lot of people here in the East, because I've been here for quite a long time, 20 years plus, I find a lot of people here in the East really like religion. Really like religious practice. They really do. But they go in with a raw expectation. And they get very disappointed. So what we need to do is we need to speak out. I need to speak out. I need to make this clear. And what this message I'm giving today is just short term. But I'm going to repeat this in more extended and more bigger parts in the future to help people. To help them. Why? That they will practice religion the correct way and get the correct results. So what happens is once we study Dharma, Buddha's teachings, like a sick person, we won't get healed immediately, but we will get better. We will get better. It depends on how strong or deep our illness is, we will get better. So what happens is that once we enter religion, none of our problems go away. None of our problems ever go away. The problems remain the same. And while we're practicing and meditating, doing pujas of black tea, the problems might be growing and getting even bigger. So when we finish our meditation session, we find out it's double the worse. That's that's happened. It's happened to me. So the thing is, this is why if we understand the nature of our mind and we understand the nature of the problems and where they arise from, how they arise from, we know we know cause and effect. We will have the soundness and stability of the mind and the patience and effort to overcome those problems. And we will. And the growth we achieve from spiritual practice means we learn and we understand and then we grow and not be taken away. And that growth is steps to enlightenment. The total growth is full enlightenment. Full. And that's why we enter Dharma. So, as we progress and we make a special relationship with our Yudha, and we make a special identity with our Yudha, and a special identification, sorry, identification with our Yudha, and we make a special relationship with our Dharma protector, in our case, etc., we make a special relationship. There is help along the way. They're like road signs. They're like rest stops. From here to JP, from here to Penang, there are rest stops. So our car, you know, we can, there's, there's phones along the highway. It's a civilized country. Um, there are rest stops where we can, you know, instead of peeing in a cup. And we can get food. So there are rest stops along the way. So these dark protectors are like rest stops along the way. That's what they are. But they can't make the journey for us. And why am I using this example? Because then what I'm saying will stick in my mind very strongly. That's very, very important. So remember something, religion doesn't solve your problems. Religion helps your mind. So when the problems arise, you can solve the problems. That's right. Religion helps your mind. 
so that when the problems come, you solve your problems. Isn't that ugly, blatant, and truthful, yet refreshing? Very refreshing. Because here we are going, you need to talk and help us? Well, she can, but not the way you think she can. Well, what does that exactly mean? That's what we're going to do. You mean such a, you know, I've been offering all this black tea for nothing? No, you haven't. You've been helping a thirsty traveler. So, how we practice. How we practice. And how it manifests. That's what we're going to do.